So I'd like to thank Bonar for invitation. It's always nice to be in Southern California. Um, if this was a December and we have a snow in, you know, uh, northeast, it would have been better. But this is this is very nice. Um, so, you know, initially when I was talking to Bonar, I, I I thought maybe I'll talk, you know, on certain imaging, you know, or devices that I'm working on. But then, but then, um, you know, recently I had a, a talk with Tom Jaoranzi. Tom Jaoranzi is a, is a, um, one of now exactly whatever administrator OSA, and he asked me um, to do some um, set up an exhibit for this OSA conference because he said they are really trying to highlight a robotic aspect, and then and then they really wanted to see how optics is affecting in you know robotics technology. And he, he asked me because he know that I've been working on, with the robotics for, for a long time. And, and, and so I figured, well, maybe that's not a bad topic for uh, a seminar because, you know, no matter where I go in biophotonics, we don't really talk too much about robotics. But, you know, it's a hard area. Um, people, there's a, people are working on self-navigating cars and, and things like that. So I really set this thing up as like an overview of uh, surgical robots and then perhaps the direction and how the photonics can enhance our medical robotics. Um, so, so, I mean, as you know, really the robotics started with the manufacturing. Um, so this is one of the Telsa, um, a factory in Fremont, California. And you see there's, you don't see too many people there. It's all those robots that's working on there. And then, and then also, you know, the growing area is a consumer robots. Uh, you know, there's an example of a robotic walking uh, uh, a dog, and but that's also a growing area. So if you look at the different segments of uh, robotics, you'll see that initially all the robots uh, market was in manufacturing. But you'll see since 2000, there's a very strong growth of uh, other sectors of uh, robotics especially in the area of personal service robot for home use, but also you see a very large, significant growth in medical warfare robots. So, and so I'll talk about, you know, uh, uh, medical robots. So if you look at medical robotics market, uh, so I got this one from Entry of Surgical Assistance Annual Report. So this is a, a company that produces Da Vinci robots, so many of you are familiar with. So if you look at worldwide uh, procedures, so these are number for annual. So if you look at 2009, so there's just over 200,000 procedures done using uh, medical robots, okay? So mostly, you know, using Da Vinci machines. And then you see that more than half, over 100,000, is done in urology. Okay. And then there's also a large portion in gynecology, but there's very small portion in a general surgery. But what you see is that urology, which actually enabled into a surgical system to really market their Da Vinci machine, is, hasn't seen a, a, a too much strong growth. But you see there is a very strong growth in gynecology and also in general surgery. And 2015, so there's over 600,000 procedures. And, and then at the same time, I mean, I wanted to show you this, because if you look at health care costs from 1960 to, you know, projected in 2020 in the United States, you see all this growth. Um, so, um, so roughly, you know, um, I mean, they're expecting somewhere in a $5 trillion. I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, tremendous, you know, amount of money. And in the United States, we spend more money per capita than any other place. So we spend about $8,600. Um, and then and in, in terms of percentage, you also we spend more than anybody else. It's about 17.7% of GDP. And... And if you look at all the health, you know, surgical costs, the surgeries are biggest parts of hair care costs for inpatient and outpatient services. So this number is a little bit outdated because it's 2011. 
for our patients, we spend an average of $3,673 for outpatient surgery. For inpatient, it's roughly $30,000 okay, for visit per patient. So that's a huge, you know, large amount of money. So there is actually a lot of money are spent in surgeries compared to diagnostics. Okay? So why robots? Yeah. So, so, so one of the big costs associated with surgery is the complications. So if you have to redo the surgery again because there's a complication, it actually sometimes, you know, the, the, the overall cost not only, you know, doubles or triples, sometimes it could be a, a, a tenfold. So if you improve surgical precision, okay, it may reduce the overall cost, okay? And then also you will reduce surgical complications, okay? and also reduce surgical duration. So these are the goals. This, this doesn't mean that this is what's happening. Okay? And then also reduce surgery of, of fatigue. Because some of the surgical procedure may take you know, five, six hours, or some neurosurgery may take 10, 12 hours. Okay? So standing there you know, doing performing those surgical procedures for that prolonged time you know, is an issue. Okay? And also, what may also may happen is because you know, surgical robots precision and many different aspects may enable a novel surgical procedure. So I may talk about a little bit as, as, of that as well. Okay, but you know what many people you know uh, envision when when they do a robot is um, initially was you know purely standalone robot that actually performs surgery. But current regulatory requirements do not allow pure robotic surgery. What you need is, a, you need a, you know, a human machine team. Basically, the machine enabled surgeons' capability to perform surgeries precisely. That's the goal, okay? Okay, so in order to do that, the integration of information processing with the sensing and robotic to produce a superhuman man-machine team is, is what we try to pursue. So in generally, there's a two different ways that you could envision this happening, okay? And then one way is called surgical CAM, CAD CAM model, and then another one is called a surgical assistant model. So I'll, I'll just give you an example of those two. And then, so surgical CAM CAM model is, um, is basically using pre-operative image and things like that. You have a model, surgical model, and surgical site that you want to perform a, a, a known procedures, okay? And then you use, a, and you use that as a kind of virtual fixture to drive a medical robot or machine to perform a machining in a way, okay? And then, and then you have a total, what they call, a quality management that's done by surgeons to make sure that is completed correctly based on the CAD model, graphing model that you have. Another one is, so this is actually more machine dependent and much more image dependent. Another one is a surgical assistant model where basically surgeon is performing the surgery but it relies on machine to perform the procedures, okay? So let me just give you a, a surgical CAM model over. So there's, so in order to do CAD CAM model, you have to do what they call pre-operative imaging. So you use a CT scan, for example, or MRI imaging. And then you do a pre-operative planning using the images that you obtain, decide where to drill, how far to drill, okay? And then you do what they call intraoperative registration, which means the so robot knows where the surgical site is, where the, those femur bones are. Okay? And then basically use a computer assist to execute plan. So you have basically like, you know, computer driven milling machine to uh, perform uh, it. And you could have uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous machine to do this. Okay? And a good example is a Robodop. Um, have you ever heard uh, the robot called Robodop? So Robodop was the, I would say the first medical robot okay? to do a hip replacement surgery. So it does a computer assist planning and execution. The idea is that it will increase dimensional accuracy, placement accuracy, more consistent outcome, 
Okay? And then this is an example of basically using human you know, drill and a robot drill, and you could just example shows that you can have a much clean, uh, a precise drilling uh, using robot. Okay? So, um, so there are about 50 systems were installed worldwide. So there are Europe, Asia, and Europe. Um, and um, so there has been about 20,000 hip and knee replacement surgeries over the years. Okay? Um, Robodoc somehow no longer used in Europe, and then, but it's primarily used in Asia. And then one particular country, uh, Korea, had been using this uh, very highly. Um, I don't actually don't know which hospitals, but they, they claim a, they, they do about 2,500 surgeries per year. Okay? So, so that's the, that's, so I, I wouldn't say that's, you know, really the trend because it just has not seen a very strong growth. The, the area they've seen a very strong growth is this a surgical assistant robot. And a good example is a, a Da Vinci machine. Okay? So Da Vinci was um, um, initially developed for a, a battlefield telesurgery. Okay? So I, I know the founder of uh, Interim Surgical System. His name is Fred Moll. He's a, a cardiologist. He's a car, you know, the heart surgeon. And, and then when he actually started, actually, he, he, uh, he had a, a DARPA grant to develop a robot for heart surgery. But, you know, it never really took off as a, as a, as a, as for a heart surgery. It, it somehow, you know, so urology was a, a successful application. But anyway, so the whole idea is that surgeon has uh, basically this teleoperative, uh, you know, user um, a station, uh, or the, you know, and and then the the robot will be on remote site, like in battlefield. And then, so if you have a soldier, uh, a, a soldiers or uh, you know sailors or marines that was um, was injured, he could um, use this uh, robot with uh, here is. Uh, you know, uh, a pay, you know, binocular view to be able to perform this complicated uh, surgery. Okay, so um, so this setup here also sometimes called a master slave setup. So here's your master, and here's your slave, and this is a remote operated. So. You know, now when you go see a, uh, uh, this kind of robotic surgery, usually they're not in the separate room. So you have, uh, you know, um, the slave part that over the patient, and then you have a master part that's actually, you know, pretty much right next to it. So sometimes if there's a things, they, they, you know, jump back and forth. But usually it requires an assistant. So you have a assistant, you know, one assistant, maybe two assistant that has to replace the, the tools as needed and, and place it. So as I said, so initially it was designed for minimally invasive cardiac bypass procedures. Okay, so this is a, a traditional bypass with a full cavity exposure, and, and this is obviously you know a Da Vinci minimally invasive approach. Okay, so usually they make a three incisions. Okay, so so those tools are uh, those the side ones are actual tools. And then the center one is an endoscope. So usually you may actually have a say cutter and then you have a forcep or something like that. Okay, so and so the benefits, okay? So decrease patient trauma because you are making smaller incisions. So enhanced surgical precision, shorter patient recovery. And then so this is, you know, uh, suture side after traditional approach, and then this is a robotic assisted, okay? Some bruising, but, you know, smaller incisions, okay? So typically incision is maybe on about an inch, so you get basically three incisions, so total is three inches. So, you know, so I would say Da Vinci is a, is a success, right? Everybody heard about Da Vinci machines. So currently there's a 3,266 systems installed worldwide. So that's based on 2014 annual report. Uh, so prostatectomy, uh, in case of prostatectomy, um, 
In 2007, you know, over 50% of a prostatectomy in the U.S. were performed by Da Vinci. Today, there are more than 80%. Okay? So it's the fastest growing, you know, but it's the growing market is in gynecology. And then, you know, I mean, financial success. 2011, their revenue was $1.7 billion. And then um, their cap now is over $20 billion. Okay? So, so it's really fast growing. And, you know, they are not only going into gynecology, but they are going into, you know, um, um, orangology, you know, and, 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 and then um, um, you know, um, in other type of uh, orthopedic surgeries and, 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 and things like that. So I think it just, you know, it's actually finding new application in, 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 in different area of a surgical field. But it's not all good news. Because if you look at complications, okay, so, um, you know, so my view may be slightly different than in the surgical system because they already think that everything is nice. But I mean, I think they, they realize, you know, there are some issues. Um, so this is a study done in September, recent study done in, 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 in 2017. So it says adverse effect in robotic surgery in a prospect study of 14 years of FDA data. Okay, and so if you look at uh, um, um, you know um, you know trend, so if you look um, the look at let's just first look at these black dots, all all um, events per procedures. Okay, so this is a proceed so for hundred thousand procedures. So the, like the first one would be like seven hundred and eighty cases per hundred thousand procedures. Okay. And if you look at this, so I mean, there's a little bit of ripple, but you see generally there is a downward trend, okay? So in the early beginning, in 2004 to maybe 2011, where actually there's a minimum, okay? There has been a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't say a lot of issues. The issues were mostly related to the machine. Electric failures, you know, a joint failures, um, some software errors. Okay, and then I think they, you know, um, worked out most of those bugs. Okay, so so there has been a downward trend, you know, uh, incidences related to the machine itself. Okay, but what's alarming is that what you see is from 2011. Now there is pretty sharp growth. Okay, the question is where this, you know, this sharp growth in complication rate comes from. That actually comes from the user error. Okay. Okay. And and then he said, why suddenly user error? Um, okay. So this is kind of my view, is that so in the beginning up to certain point, most of Da Vinci machines were um, are used by large hospitals, pretty much very well trained, expert. Now this Da Vinci machine is being becoming more ubiquitous. So it's actually being used by smaller hospital. The, the doctor, I hate to say, but doctors who are less experienced and then also being used in a new procedures, okay? And then so what you see is that there's a lot of user-related um, incidents that comes on, okay? So then the question is, how do you resolve uh, this? So why is Da Vinci allowing this, you know, um, this, this user errors, okay? Also, yeah, I have, so another thing is, is that also, now people are asking also questions like, you know, so is it, is it, is a robotic surgery good for all the procedures, okay? And so, so he, here's a, um, a, a source, gynecology, okay, so they're one of their trade magazine. So if you like, look at like ovary removal, cyst removal, okay, so if you look at average cost between robotic and laparoscopic method, so robotics, so basically cost roughly, I mean, you know, not quite two times, but $7,400, whereas a, you know, laparoscopic cost of about $4,000. So it's actually more expensive. And if you look at the complication rate, you see the robotic is not lower, it's actually higher, okay? So you have to ask, so is it really robotic useful for all procedures? Okay, 
So as, as I said, now, you know, early just mentioned, so more hospitals, more users are using it. And it may be also because it related to this learning curve, okay? So, um, so they said learning curve for robotic surgery is between 20 to 90 cases, okay? So if you go to hospital, if the doctor tells me, I just got this robot and I can't wait to try this on you, okay? Run away, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so 20, 90 cases, okay? For a large hospital, this could be one month. For some hospital, this could be one year, okay? So, but interior surgical consider a robotic surgeon to be a true expert after completing about 200 cases, okay? So I think that's actually really the more reasonable number. So if you want to get surgery, you want to make sure that surgeon had at least 200 cases. So don't be that first, you know, 200 patients, okay? All right. So, but that, that 200 means really, you know, two, three years at least, okay? Um, so also, you know, I should also mention, um, you know, without really going into the limitation of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, interviews, you know, uh, 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 surgical systems, you know, the Da Vinci machine. Um, it, it's a big, expensive machine. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, depends on whatever functionality. You can spend basically, you know, easily $2 million on a system, but you can also lease it. Um, but also there's a, you know, a maintenance because they, they, they said, you know, you have to replace the joints like every year. So that costs like $100,000, $200,000 and things like that. And for things like a system removal and things like that, you may not need large robot. So one of the train is uh, what's called cooperative robot, okay? So it's a much simpler system. Basically what it is, is uh, here's a surgical tool. It's being held by a person, but really the, the actual movement of the tool is done by the robot. And then basically what the person is doing is, is, is actually it's controlling it. And it's controlled by, because there's a, a sensor in there. It actually senses the forces that are supplied by the hand and robot actually does the movement. And nice thing about it is that you can actually remove the hand tremor. You can do motion scaling, so you can do much more precise movement, okay? And then, so we developed different type of uh, of uh, this cooperative robot for eye surgery, or oncology, or actually cochlear implant surgeries and things like that, or doing a, you know, a, a very simple procedure like a suturing, but endoscopic suturing. So it has an application in a wide range of micro, smaller surgeries, uh, and things like, as I said, neurosurgery, cardiovascular eye, ear, nose, and throat, okay? So, um, so I'll just give you some examples uh, and where um, this, you know, optical technology can actually help with a different robot. So here's an um, example of, uh, um, you know, uh, this cooperative robot that we developed. So we call this one the iRobot. And this for, so, so there is a, a sensor handler that where the, it's, it's being held by a surgeon. And also what we have is we have an OCT system that we use to basically guide and then, and then, and then um, help enhance the surgical procedures. So why do you need those things, okay? Um, so if you look at challenges in microsurgery, so I'm just giving you an example of, you know, virtual retinal surgery and cochlear implant surgery. Um, when, you, when you do those surgeries, as you can see, they use a surgical microscope, okay? And when you use a surgical microscope, also Da Vinci using those basic endoscope, stereoscope, you have a really a limited view. Okay, and then once also when you have a tool, um, you have also you know a shadowing effect. So, but anyway, so you have a special resolution and also depth perception issues. Okay, and then also movement during micro manipulation of tissue due to surgeon you know tremor or whatever is 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 an issue. And so, what you want to do is that you want to use an image to to be able to allow the surgeons to see a robot to guide the procedures better by producing imaging, uh, not only imaging, but distance ranging, motion compensation, device guidance tracking, and certain, you know, a tissue segmentation. Um, but a lot of those things requires real time, okay? So pre-operated imaging, right? You just like a, take a snapshot, but this needs to be dynamic, okay? Surgeon needs to see what 
he is doing with the tools and how you know what the tissues are doing the uh, procedures itself. Okay. So typically, when we do an optical imaging, we try to do a uh, three different functions. Okay. So so these are three uh, main functions we want we want our imaging to do. First is what we call safety barrier. Okay? We want to use the image to, to, to enforce safety constraint, like preventing unintentional collision of the instrument with the tissue surface. Okay? But not any tissue surface. For example, it could be like blood vessels. Okay? And then number two is ability to scan the probe across the surface while maintaining a constant distance offset. Okay? Or, you know, what we think, just, let me just call that as a, a surface tracking. Because sometimes patient could move. And you don't want your tool to be stationed suddenly if there is an unintentional movement by my patient. So what you want is that you want tools to react and then basically pull back, something like this. Okay? And then an ability to create a virtual fixture and guide the surgical tool precisely, which we call our targeting. So those are three main functions for our imaging systems. Safety barriers, surface tracking, and then targeting. Okay, so let me just give you an example of a safety uh, barrier. Okay, so here is a basically a needle, and this has OCT sensor. Okay, and then so say this is a target, and what this person is trying to do is uh, touch this target using this needle. But what we did was we put a safety constraint where we said this should not be say closer than say 200 microns. Okay, and this thing is attached to a linear motor. So when you get that close, what it does is it pulls back. So let me just play this. I don't know if you can see it. So the hand is actually pushing it forward, but you see that needle is pulling back. OK? OK. So this one is a surface tracking. So basically, the target is moving, okay? And then there's a forcep with also OCT sensor. And what it's doing is it's sensing motion, and it's trying to maintain a constant offset, preventing an accidental collision, so. Oh, yeah. Okay. So next. Oh. Okay. So that's surface tracking. So this one is, you know, I mean, this virtual fixture. I have a good example of virtual fixture later, but uh, this is just, uh, this is not a movie. So what, basically what happens is you, you scan and you identify target, and then basically using robot, what you do is this is actually a kind of cutting injection. And basically have the, have, you know, follow the, uh, the, basically track the tool, and then, and then basically um, place it on that uh, particular target. So when we do all those things, we're actually doing all these things simultaneously. So there are multiple constraints. So even though target is moving, this would actually still, because it does that um, you know, uh, uh, motion compensation, it still moves the same way and then, and then uh, basically put the, put the needle right at the target. Okay. And, um, okay. So let me just give you, as a, as a, for targeting, let me just give you an example of a cochlear implant surgery. So um, this is, I mean, we have, a, we have a, where is Brian? I mean, I don't know where he, whether uh, he does this uh, uh, cochlear implant surgery. Do you, okay. So this work was, we worked with um, this with uh, John DiParco. He was a chair of oncology at USC, but he was an interim chair of oncology at um, Hopkins. He moved a few years ago, and uh, I mean, sadly, he recently passed away. And then, so this project is in a little bit of a limbo. Um, but anyway, so um, so this surgery um, is to place electrode implant that can replace damaged cochlear hair. Okay. So the sound is detected by external microphone which is converted to electrical signal by an electrode array. An electrode array are naturally curved, um, but, you know, but strained by wire known as stylet. So basically, so this is an electrode, okay? So you see the electrodes are basically curved like this, okay? And there is a, 
metal stylet that actually gets inserted in there that, that basically uh, make it straight. Okay? So idea is to basically put this electrode away inside this cochlea. Okay? But it's not an, you know, I mean, it's widely done, but there are a lot of um, mistakes, complications that, that's, um, um, let me actually go back. The complication associated with this, uh, this uh, uh, surgery. Okay? So this is a cochlea. Okay? So this, this turn here is called first basal turn. Okay? So on here, there's all this, you know, um, the, the, the sensory hairs and things like that. So this point is not really visible by the surgeon. So what they do is they lower it, they approximate the position of the electrode array, and what they do is they pull the stylus and they push the electrode away inward. And what happens is the electrode array gets wrapped around, okay, and then hopefully placed in, in correct position. The problem is because, um, you know, it needs to be deployed somewhere here. That's the optimum de deployment point. But what happens is if you push it too deep, it actually touches it and damages the, electric, uh, the, the, the sensory hair. And then if you deploy it, then it basically drags all along here. Okay? So these are lower frequency components. If you don't um, deploy deep enough, and if you're too shallow, actually what happens is there's no the collision, but it actually drags along the top part. Okay? So it, it, it creates problems. So it needs to be deployed in a correct position. So, but the question is, how do you do it? So here is a cooperative robot. Um, we developed a cochlear implant uh, a surgery based on what we call steady hand robot. So, so here is, you know, a robot with the mechanical arms, okay? And then, and then here is actually OCT system with a rotary uh, imaging probe, okay? And then which are attached to a, uh, um, uh, you know, basically the mechanical arm. So basically what we are doing is we are using the robot to do the scanning. Okay? And then what we do is once we scan, we know exactly the position and then the shape of this cochlea. And once done that, then we can precisely use this robot to deploy the electrode array in a correct place. Okay? So, so this is basically, so we get this uh, basically CAD model of a cochlea. We know the depth, we know the angle, okay? And then we do the deployment. So here is a way to one of the... Um, surgeons that we worked with, so we did the experiment, okay, where we, did, we compare um, three different uh, uh, methods of insertion. One is a pure manual insertion, the second is robot assist insertion, and the third is robot assist insertion with uh, image, OCT image as a virtual fixture, okay? And then so we have this nice plastic model that we had that was given by a cochlear corporation who actually makes those cochlear implants. And then, and then, so this way we can monitor whether this is being inserted correctly or not. Okay. So these are the results. Okay. So we compare the surgeon with novice, which means graduate students. Um, but actually, you know, our old graduate students become now is becoming a you know pretty good at doing um, surgical stuff. Um, right. So if you look at the manual. Um, obviously, you know, the surgeons performs a uh, better, okay? So this is, uh, I should also mention, this is a distance from ideal point, okay? So yeah, it's an average distance. And then if you look at the surgeons, basically their variation is, dispersion is much smaller. But, you know, but they are typically here in the average about 1.3 a millimeter from the optimum point, okay? Maybe that's not a huge issue, but they do a pretty good job. Now here, the novice um, has, you know, it's a farther from ideal point, 1.7 or so, but the, also the big problem is there's a large dispersion. Okay, so that could be one end to the another end of that first basal turn. Now, if you do a robot assisted surgery, um, you know, this is a little surprising, and we've done multiple tests. Um, so, surgeon now does it much better. Um, there are about six 
100 microns from the ideal point, and the dispersion is a little larger. Maybe that's learning curve associated with it. But from Navas, actually, it got, the result got uh, much worse, okay? Um, you know, don't know, don't know why. But now, if you let, um, if you incorporate a virtual fixture, so when you do virtual fixture, actually deployment position is not determined by you. It's actually determined by the robot itself, uh, knowing where it needs to be deployed. So if you do that, and then what happens is a surgeon's deployment point actually is, it has improved, okay, to 0.5. And then dispersion is small, but also what surprising me is actually, you know, Navos is it's it's actually gotten a lot better, significantly better. I think mainly because they do less. Um, you know, they don't try to over manipulate the robot. Okay. So, um, so in terms of accuracy results, robot decreases a surgeon's mean error by about 0.7 millimeter. Versus picture decreases. Uh, Novus error by about 1.4 millimeter, which is very significant. So there's about 60% mean decrease in accuracy error using virtual fixtures. And then we repeat it, and then so, I mean, it's, you know, so robot increased surgeons repeatability by about 0.1 millimeters, and novices repeatability decreased by 0.36 millimeters, thereby by 0.63 millimeters. Okay. So this actually kind of shows one set of experiment. So the ideal point is, is, is really somewhere there, okay? And then you'll see that with the 3D imaging, virtual fixture created by OCT, you know, so it's very close to the ideal point. If you, for just a manual insertion, I mean, it's all over the place, okay? And then for robot assist insertion with that virtual fixture, uh, you know, average seems to be a little bit higher up. So in this case, it seems to help. Okay. So now let me just talk about different application and different robot and maybe you know, also different imaging system. Um, one is intestine anastomosis. Um, I have yet to find a surgeon that said, I love suturing. You know, they hate it. It's like, uh, I done my surgery, so you, you know, in turn, you do the suture and they usually leave. But suturing is actually a very important aspect of a surgical procedure that people don't want to do, you know. And some very good doctors are bad sutures, <laughs> you know. I, I don't know why, and he just, you know, it, it is. So anyway, so here's the intestinal osmosis, okay. So it's a very common procedure. Um, to establish intestine continuity, right? So we know this, okay? And so um, and it's one of those things, as I said, not too many doctors want to do. So here is is a, a robot that, that we're developing in collaboration with uh, uh, Children's National Hospital in D.C., uh, University of Maryland College Park, and also at Hopkins, okay? So, um, so if you know, are you guys familiar with a robot called KUKA? So it's kind of like based on that KUKA robot. Okay, you can buy for like $100,000 and you can develop into a different you know, medical robots or you know, manufacturing and things like that. So basically that's a, that's a, a, a KUKA, um, okay? <clears throat> so, so this is a robot called Smart Tissue Anastomosis Robot in Anastomosis Surgery, okay? So you have a surgical a tool which is basically sewing machine at the, at the tip. Okay? And then we use a vision system to guide the, the suturing itself. So what kind of vision system are we using? Okay. Oh, so this is a basically what it's doing. So basically this robot is actually uh, doing, doing suturing with the, you know, with the person's assistant. But, um, so, but also it does all it automatically. Okay. So, so for this one, we're actually using a... Uh, um, a different imaging system, okay? So, um, so earlier Bernard uh, mentioned that I actually, you know, work on different, um, uh, you know, imaging systems. 
and yes, we actually work on all kind of imaging systems because the reason is that we don't develop imaging system for just imaging system development sake. We develop imaging system for specific applications. And we don't say our oh, OCT is ideal for all imaging systems, I mean, all surgical applications. What we found out, of course, is for, you know, for example, some, some neuroscience study, um, say photoacoustic may be a better imaging system because through skull, you know, then say OCT system. So we actually tend to adopt, modify different imaging systems for different surgical applications. So for this particular one, we decided to use a, a 3D structure light endoscope to integrate with the robots. So this is a, this is a system that we developed. So here's that uh, star robot with a surgical tool. And then here is our 3D endoscope our system. Okay. And we could do uh, 3D imaging at about 1.5. I mean, we, we, if you push it, we can do actually about 3, 4 hertz. Um, Okay. So it actually does multiple functions. So this has a capability to do what they call multispectral imaging. So this is a, a, a intestine, piece of intestine. And what it does is actually we have a multiple a colors that we flash. And then you, what we do is we use that to do a different class, uh, tissue classification. So we can uh, see where the inside of intestine is, where is a, you know, mesentery is, where the sutures are, things like that, okay? And the reason that we do that is because we need to identify or tell robot where is the optimum suturing point is, okay? So, so, we look at, so we look at the intestine, we look at where the borders are, and then we decide on possible suture line from, you know, this is all done image processing, okay? And then once we've done that, then what I would do is we need to be able to see the shape of the tissue, and then we have to be able to track. So, um, and, and this method is actually pretty accurate in terms of depth. Um, OCT is obviously more accurate, but the problem with OCT is that it's hard to get a high resolution over a large volume, but this allows you to, uh, to see. So usually, if you look at the error in terms of depth error, our error is, is actually pretty, pretty small. Our error, so, if you look at the uh, mean calculated uh, you know, uh, uh, depths, and then if you look at physical depths, um, so that's you know, 10 millimeters. So the errors are, you know, are typically less than you know, like 100, 200 uh, micron. Okay? So for really precision microsurgery, you know, that's a problem. But for general surgery, like on osteomosis, that's not a big issue. So let me show you what this vis you know, image sees. So here, basically, our imaging system is basically uh, scanning across this section of the intestine, okay? And, and then basically, this color map is an infest map, but basically, different color corresponds to different depths. So you see, as you scan, I don't know if you can correlate what you see. So this, this big part is this part here, okay? And then this is basically the forcep um, working over uh, a particular part of tissue. So, because the imaging speed is slow, I mean, you could see there's a little bit of gray. But, you know, what it does is it allows the, t the robot to see how far that section is. So it allows it to go and then grab and pull back. Okay? So that resolution is enough for it to do it. Okay? And um, so now, actually, let me just go back to uh, uh, OCT sensor. Um, so, you know, when we were, so, you know, um, so I started actually working on this robotics as, you know, as soon as I actually joined um, Hopkins uh, 98. And that's the year we got a, a funding from uh, NSF uh, for establishing ERC. You know, ERC stands for Engineering Research Center. And then the title of ERC was a CIIST. What it is is a Computer Integrated Surgical System and Technology. And the director is a Ross Taylor. He's probably one of the biggest name in medical robotics. And, and um, we started working together because he wanted to, you know, to make their robot smart by having some optical sensors. So we developed different force sensors, you know, and, 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 and distal sensors and things like that. 
And then so, so, but when we started it, we started for, you know, for Da Vinci machine, and then we later moved to cooperate robots. And, but over the years, as we worked on it, um, you know, and there were some doctors who didn't like the big robots, you know. I really like the hand tools, you know, because that's the tools that I use in my surgery. So can you actually somehow shrink this big robot into something simpler form? And then we looked at their, you know, uh, procedures, and the area they had most difficulty were the axial control. Uh, most people didn't really have too much problem with the lateral control during the surgery, but the axial control it was a always problem because of the depth control. So basically, so we developed what they call smart uh, uh, surgical tools. It's, but it's a very simple device. So you, you could have a, a injector, cutter, hook, you know, forceps. And then all these tool tips is connected to a linear motor. And then there's a distal sensor, OCT distal sensor, at the distance, at the, at the far end of the surgical tool. And what it does is it actually s senses how fast the tool tip is moving, how close it is to tissue, and then we do the uh, manipulations uh, automatically to do a precision uh, injection. So let me skip all those introductory. But let me just give you an example of injection. Okay? So when you actually try to inject something very precisely, right depth, and we have the surgeon perform the injection. So this is a typical. We had surgeons do a lot of different things. But you know, so you inject certain depth. And then usually there's some variability in how far you could inject. And then you see this, uh, this position. So there's a hand tremor that's associated. Um, so you have a hand tremor that's like three to five, you know, seven, and also there's like a certain band. And there's something that you cannot get rid of it. If you're an experienced surgeon, that actually decreases. But you have this hand tremor. But if we use OCT to control the motion and depth, this is an injection you get. Basically, the, the tool goes into the right depth, and it locks it okay, to that depth. Because we have the ability to lock the tool tip at the particular uh, depth. So here's, a, here's a, a, a video that shows it. So this is a control by a hand. So initially, you see that it, there's, a, there's some movement. It moves forward. And then once it gets the close, the, basically the machine locks the needle to the uh, you know, desired depth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you actually see the injection depth, the you know, variability in the injection depth is like less than three micron. Okay. So question is, what can you do with this? Okay. So one of the things that's kind of you know hot in ophthalmology is a, a gene and stem cell therapy. Okay. There's a people with you know a different type of uh, you know retinal. Um, um, diseases uh, like macular degeneration, age related, and also like uh, diabetic related uh, generation, oh, but also you know some kids pediatric that actually comes with uh, uh, you know uh, from when they were uh, born. Okay, and and one of the things that you want to do is uh, maybe deliver uh, you know a gene or stem cell to the photoreceptive layer to to actually have that. Uh, a function map. But in order to do that, you actually have to deliver those gene and stem cell in a subretinal space, which is right above the what's called RPE and then into the, um, into the outer, um, not outer, um, but um, basically the, into the photoreceptive layer. And you know, OCT has been widely used for ophthalmology application. And my thing is that you can actually see those all these layers, OK? And, and then because you can see it, if you can track um, where the needle is, you can deliver the gene. So this just shows that we can use our OCT to, to track different layers, at even if it comes in different angles. Okay? So here is uh, just a, a video of, uh, of uh, uh, this is, we're just injecting ICG dye. Okay? So you can see. So the injection depth is very shallow. It's about 200, 250 microns. So it's very superficial. Okay. 
So this is just the distilled information of how deep it's actually going. Okay. So, um, so the first one was done by experienced surgeon. The second one is done by, uh, you know, engineering graduate students. Okay. So actually, there's really hardly no difference between those two. Okay. So these are um, one of our injection results. So we've done uh, 20 trials, six injections per trial, two trials per eye. And then we have, in this case, we had uh, um, mm -hmm. four testers, two of them were surgeons, one more experienced than another. And then we had uh, two engineers. Okay. We injected ICG, and then we targeted a four receptive layer. Okay. Um, and then if you look at the injection track, I don't know if you can see it, but so for, if you do freehand, so there's over penetration. So this is actually a layer we wanted to inject. You, you have a, okay? So if you do depth guided example, you'll see, so this is where we deposited ICG. So it's just, just right above RPE layer. So that's actually well done. And then if you actually look at the difference between the, where it was deposited between the surgeon and the engineer, there isn't a huge difference. And then here is a, um, one example, a summary. Okay. So if you do the injection depth freehand, whether you're a surgeon or, um, or uh, engineer, um, the error was pretty large. Okay. And most cases, basically, there was over penetration. So, so, you know, so in the basically depositing things into a sclera. Okay. And, um, and if you look at um, the surgeon, it's very good. And the dispersion is actually quite small. Okay. So actually, you know, here, they are much better than the, the engineer. Engineer had a little bit larger uh, dispersion. But still, you know, um, we injected five nanoliter for each injection. Um, actual injection volume was about 3.7 because there were some losses um, during the insertion and things like that. Uh, but except for, I think, I think, um, I mean, this was right at the boundary. Um, so that may have been a problematic. But, you know, in most, so for surgeons, um, out of all the injections, um, there were no failures. And then, so um, for engineers, um, it's really hard to say uh, there's any uh, failures based on the images we have. But, but, you know, so there was a two that was right at the boundary. But you see the results are much better than, uh, um, than using the free hand. Okay. And then um, based on that technology, we also made a forceps. So this is a micro forcep, a company called Alcon makes. Okay? They sell this one for about $500. Okay? And then they choose for a VH, widely used for VHO retinal surgery. And then we made our own version. Okay? And then they use a motion compensation technology. The reason that we did was, is because if you look at this, so they have a manual squeezer. And then the biomechanics of manual squeezer is such that when you squeeze it, basically the, the whole thing moves forward, okay? So the experienced surgeon knows that. So what they do is as they're, during their squeezing, they slightly pull back to compensate for the lengthening of the, the, the whole finger. So, but what happens is as they close, open, close, open, there is this motion associated with the close and open, okay? So, in order to get rid of that mechanical aspect, we put a touch sensor on it. By putting touch sensor, a lot of that has largely gone away. At least it, it decreased significantly. And then when you actually put an addition of a motion compensation by putting a linear motor, what happens is during the you know, squeezing and open motion, it's, it's flat. Okay? So here's a basically um, you know, like demonstration. Here's a, a small clear uh, a fiber. That fiber is basically 125 micron in diameter. And then basically what we're going to do is we're going to grab that using our... So if, you, if I ask you to do this without the motion compensation, you would have a very hard time doing it. And this is actually sitting on a very soft gel, and you'll be poking into that gel. But here, you see, we're actually trying to touch it, but it doesn't. It kind of floats on top of it, and then it allows you to be able to grab it without touching the surface very precisely. Okay. And then you can also do that same thing for cutting. So here's demonstration. We're trying to cut into some tissue 100 micron deep. 
Okay? And if you, if you cut it manually, this is a cutting depth you typically get, you know, large variations. If you do the motion compensation within that robot, you know, simple robotic technique, then you could maintain the cutting depth very precisely at 100 uh, micron dip. Okay? So, this is my last slide. Um, so, so, you know, my prediction is that, you know, I think we're just at the beginning. And the 3D optical imaging techniques, I should say techniques, because it's not going to be just one, will be, I think it will be used in a wide range of surgical setting and provide machine vision to enable a precise robotic surgical planning and guidance. Okay? And so I'd like to thank all the funding agency. And then, you know, I just write proposals. So those guys are one that does all the work. I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, you know, people in ophthalmology, uh, dermatology, uh, urology, and then uh, gynecology, um, uh, neurosurgery, and then neuroscience, and then um, um, who else? I forgot. Oh, uh, otology. Okay? Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so we, we call it safety barrier. Safety barrier. Yeah. So all of those types of technologies, it seems to me, have to be mandated to be put in. Is that correct? Or what's the purpose of trying to be modeled out and that? Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, I think, you know, so let me just step back and say, you know, what, you know, interior surgical systems are maybe doing. So, so you know, they realize, they know, um, there is actually a problem with the uh, machine vision issues. And then there are also problems with some perhaps, um, you know, training issue about how to set up the, the robotic arms. You know, so a lot of, let me just first say, so there's a two areas that it, there's a complication that occurs. One is exactly at near the surgical site. So they need to increase the accuracy and visibility of where the robot is seeing. Another is, uh, is uh, the, the point of entry, okay? So the robot is actually designed, so if there's a manipulation, you, you have an ISO rotation point. So this is an insertion point. And then what happens is the robot is supposed to move so it doesn't induce a force laterally, okay? So the problem is if you're trying to do it and if you do it this way, you would have a tear, bruising, and there's a lot of issues. So there's a two things in order to prevent this. One is to actually make sure when you do pre-planning that your ISO rotation point is a correct position so that when you do manipulation, it doesn't induce you know, uh, excessive force around it. Okay? Another one is if you do, then it has to tell 
the surgeon that this is actually what's, what's happening, okay? So that's actually sensory issues. Another thing is when you do it, as you say, suddenly if the surgeon moves forward for whatever reason because he needs to cough, you know, then you don't want to actually puncture like an artery. And so, so they, 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 they know this, but, but what they also realize is that because if you take too much away from it, you're actually taking the surgeon's control away from it. So there's actually a fine balance between what surgeon likes Right? Because they like to have more control. Engineers like to actually take away more control and give a more, you know, a robot more intelligent. You know, the latest visual system they introduce is called Firefly, which is a fluorescence imaging system that allows you to see the, the structures a little better. Um, the technology that I mentioned, this, you know, this is the OCT sensor, optical sensor based, you know, uh, distal sensing and the motion compensation, things like that, actually, Interior surgical system license it from us. So we have a patent on it and they license it, but they have not implemented it yet. Because I think, you know, that I think that um, we're not quite there yet to fully implement that into, uh, you know, uh, a surgical. So I, I, my feeling is that it's eventually we, we're going to get there, but it may be five to ten years. Right now, I think, I think people are still struggling to really you know, understand, you know, where robots really can play a significant role. Um, sometimes I, I feel like, um, this is again my just pure personal opinion, I think, I think they're, they're overly, um, you know, overly, uh, you know, uh, stating the, the usefulness of robot in all applications. Because as for many applications, you know, robots are you know, not really needed. In fact, actually, even neurology, I hate to say this, but many, you know, experienced doctors still think that in neurology, open surgery is better than robotic surgery. They said recovery time, there's no difference, better outcome, you know, they can do much faster. So, you know, you know different doctors will say, you know, different things, you know. Yeah, so, but I don't think there's, <laughs> so I don't think it's a really, there's a one solution that fits, you know, all problems. Yes? Uh, uh, I apologize for not knowing the answer to this already, but um, does, you mentioned the different costs okay. of the robotic versus the standard version of the surgery. Yeah. Does the patient have like any kind of a choice as far as like whether their surgery is going to be using the robot or, or not? Or can they like elect to sort of Yeah, so you have a choice. So in the beginning, you have choice. And then let me tell you a funny story. Um, so um, I need to go back to uh, Korea. Uh, actually, reason, actually, Da Vinci, I mean, I don't want to say it wholly, but the, one of the reasons that, you know, Da Vinci was uh, um, uh, successful was because they were actually doing very well in, in Korea, okay? And, and then I don't remember really the difference in cost, and I actually asked somebody, so, the cost might be a little bit difficult for so for your prostate surgery, okay. So typically, if you do open, so it might be, it might actually be about thousand dollars. So we have some surgeons sitting there. But my understanding is, if you do a robotic surgery, which you could elect, then you have to pay like ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars out of pocket, okay. And then so so question is, who in right mind <laughs> who elected to do this? But there was some, uh, uh, um, I guess, a notion. Um, so when you remove the prostate, if you make a mistake, basically, man loses his one of the functions. Okay, and then there was um, there was a notion: if you use a robotic, the probability of losing that function diminishes significantly. So there was very quickly when that words got spread there were no men who wanted to use a manual preferred manual surgery everybody basically were willing to pay 10 20 thousand dollars to do the robotic surgery and now when everybody basically starting to elect robotic surgery to do the you know prospectomy basically i think the overall cost start to go down so and i think that was also may have been true in the united states so, um, but it may be still be, you know, so I think you could, I don't know whether you can elect now, because like in Hopkins, when you go, there's actually one or two doctors still could do, still does open surgery. They don't, they don't want to do a uh, robotic surgery. Uh, so if you just go, they will just do the robotic surgery. But if you elect 
particular doctors, then you could do a uh, open surgery. Yeah. So maybe you could, you could. So is it in Korea? Is it is it still out of pocket or is it covered by insurance? Do you know? The, Okay, okay. Yes, okay. So, so I think, yeah, so I think there's general um, senses among public is that robotic surgery will give you a better outcome. Sorry. So I need to. Sorry. All right, thank you.